So I'm going to be talking about hyponatremia and how to work it up and treat it. So to start by defining hyponatremia, it's defined as under 136 sodium concentration. And the important thing to remember about the physiology of this condition is that sodium concentration is controlled by free water homeostasis, not directly through sodium homeostasis. So to illustrate that, if there was very high serum sodium concentrations, that would cause the posterior pituitary to release antidiuretic hormone, which would bind to the vasopressin-2 receptors in the kidney, which would cause the insertion of aquaporin-2 channels in the kidney, which reabsorb the water flowing through, thereby concentrating the urine and decreasing the sodium concentration. And this is the mechanism by which the body corrects for a high serum sodium concentration is through water homeostasis, not through sodium homeostasis directly. So the first step in workup of hyponatremia is actually not usually done, but it's to look at the tonicity of the serum. And this is because most commonly hyponatremia is hypotonic, but occasionally there are rare causes of isotonic and hypertonic hyponatremia. So to talk about those, we'll start with hypertonic hyponatremia. And in this situation, there's an increase of a very osmotically active molecule like glucose or mannitol. So if there was a lot of glucose in the serum, that would cause the cells to shrink in order to decrease their water and increase the serum water to make up for that osmotic gradient. And that causes a dilutional hyponatremia when all of the water leaves the cells. And the rule of thumb is that for every 100 of glucose above 100, the true sodium decreases by about 2. And then there's isotonic hyponatremia, which is not really a true hyponatremia. It's actually a lab error. And in this situation, if there is a very high concentration of a non-osmotically active molecule like lipids or proteins, for example, IV immunoglobulin, the lab won't be able to correctly measure the serum sodium concentration because the photons or the pH meter will be thrown off by all of those lipids or proteins. So even though the serum sodium concentration is normal, the lab will read it off as a hyponatremia. But by far the most common cause of hyponatremia is hypotonic hyponatremia with a serum osmolality under 280. So we'll talk about each of these. So first of all, we need to talk about the volume status because this is how we break down hypotonic hyponatremia. And volume status is really done by taking a look at the patient directly, their vital signs, their physical exam. You can also look at the BUN to creatinine ratio, but really you should be looking at the patient to get a sense of their volume status. And here are the ways that you actually look at their volume status typically. Then there's the pheno, which is the fractional excretion of sodium. And this is an important way that we differentiate causes of hypotonic hyponatremia. So if we look at this equation, the first part of the equation is the ratio of the urine sodium to the plasma sodium. And what that really is telling you is how much sodium is being excreted relative to the amount of plasma sodium. And that gives you a sense of how much the kidneys are trying to hold onto sodium. This part of the equation is a correction factor for GFR, and that's done with creatinine. So we'll start with hypovolemic hyponatremia. And again, we break down the causes by the phena. And so with hypovolemic hyponatremia, the way to think about it is there's volume lost. So when the volume is lost through whatever mechanism, there has to be some re-equilibration to get the volume back into the serum. And that'll cause a hyponatremia. So breaking down hypovolemic hyponatremia is done with the phena because that'll tell you whether or not the volume's been lost through the kidneys or through some other mechanism. If the volume has been lost through the kidneys, then the kidneys will not be sodium avid and they'll be letting all of the fluid flow through, like in the situation with diuretics or an aldosterone deficiency. The kidney is sodium sparing, which is inappropriate for a hyponatremia. Whereas if the fluid has been lost through any other mechanism, the kidneys will be trying to hold on to all of the sodium, which will cause a low phena. Talking about hypervolemic hyponatremia, again, we can use the phena to break it into renal causes or other causes. And with hypo hypervolemic hyponatremia, the three causes that 
people typically think about are cardiosis, cirrhosis, and nephrosis. Cardiosis is CHF, cirrhosis is liver failure, and nephrosis is nephrotic syndrome. And with all three of these situations, you have a decrease in the effective circulating blood volume, and that'll cause the kidneys to start retaining a lot of sodium and a lot of volume, and that'll cause a low phena. Whereas with very advanced renal failure, the kidneys will lose their ability to excrete both fluid and also to hold on to sodium, and that'll cause an elevated phena with a hypervolemic state, and that'll typically have a very high creatinine value. The last cause of hypotonic hyponatremia are euvolemic causes, and we actually don't use the phena there. We take a look at the urine osmolality directly, and with a very high urine osmolality, it's typically caused by either SIADH, which is the syndrome of inappropriate ADH, or by hypothyroidism, and I'll talk about SIADH in a second, or if there's a very low urine osmolality, it's caused by either low solute through the diet or very high amounts of fluid either through the diet or through an IV line. For example, with primary polydipsia, that's where someone is drinking over 12 liters a day of pure water and the kidneys are no longer able to make up for that and they start becoming hyponatremic because of all of that free water they're consuming. Another situation is if a patient's on D10 water, that is a an equivalent situation where they're just taking in too much free water and their kidneys are not able to make up for all of that water. But it takes a lot of fluid to make it to that point. The other situation is where they're just not taking in enough solute, enough sodium. And that's through poor diet like tea and toast diet or beer potomania. So there's a lot of causes of SIADH. And if you were to go through patients in a hospital, any one of them might have any number of these conditions but that doesn't mean they automatically have SIADH. In order to make the diagnosis of SIADH, there's a set of criteria that have to be met, which include euvolemia, high urine osmolality, but low serum osmolality, which goes with a very inappropriate high ADH, which is say very high ADH will decrease the serum osmolality and increase the urine osmolality. You also, you also have to have a high urine sodium, normal thyroid and adrenal to rule out those conditions, and no diuretics to rule out that. But really, the reason to suspect SIADH in a patient is if you look and they have low serum osmolality, but very high urine osmolality with an elevated phena. And the red flag in a patient is if you give them normal, so, uh, normal saline to try to correct their hyponatremia, and it doesn't correct their hyponatremia, that's when you should suspect that they have SIADH. So those are the main causes of hypotonic hyponatremia, and it's important to take a note of this because the treatment differs based on what type of hyponatremia they have. If they're hypovolemic, the treatment is generally fluids, but if they're not hypovolemic, actually you don't want to give them fluids. You may want to fluid restrict them, especially in the situation of SIADH, and to treat their underlying cause. Briefly, treatment incorporates very careful amounts of correction. So really, if they have signs of cerebral edema, like altered mental status or radiographic evidence, you'll need to treat them more rapidly. But in general, and a slightly low sodium concentration, we don't have to worry too much about correcting that rapidly, and that can in fact be dangerous. So the other part of it is how long they've had the hyponatremia. If they've had it for a short period of time, then you can rapidly correct it. But if they've had hyponatremia for a longer period of time, their body has adjusted to the low, those low sodium concentrations, and you don't want to rapidly correct that sodium. The rule of thumb is about 8 to 10 millimoles per day of sodium correction. And no talk about hyponatremia would be complete without CPM, which is central pontine myelinysis. And in this situation with hyponatremia, you correct it too rapidly, and that causes the myelin cells in the brainstem to rapidly shrink and then dissolve, and that'll cause a myelinolysis. And there's a radiograph here where you can see in the pons some uh, damage done there. And that's caused by too rapid correction of hyponatremia. The other thing to talk about 
always with hypotonic sorry, with hyponatremia, is hypertonic saline, and when to use this. And pretty much you never use hypertonic saline, except for very, very severe hyponatremia. And you're really supposed to do it with 25 to 100 mils per hour, and you stop using hypertonic saline when it reaches 120, and you go back to a different fluid. And you almost always need to either be in the ICU or have nephrology consulted in order to use hypertonic saline because the correction can be so rapid that it can be very dangerous.